So my topic that Russell asked me to talk about is acid reflux and pulmonary disease. And many of you guys know Dr. Cooper, and that was his big topic. And Dr. Cooper went and retired on all of us. And so Russell asked me if I, if I would speak on the topic. So um, you missed it. I had a couple of Dr. Cooper slides. But um, so what I want to do is really talk about what is acid reflux, um, what causes it, how does it affect the pulmonary system? How do we work it up? And how do we treat it? And, um, and so we'll, this is going to be very informal, especially since we're drawing pictures. If you don't understand my pictures, um, and please ask lots of questions as we go. So, um, as our population is getting larger for the most part and eating less healthy diets, acid reflux has really become an issue in general for the general population, not just in the United States, but Kind of all the Western, Western, um, Western uh, civilizations and you know Europe and Asia and everybody's kind of developing um, lots of acid reflux. So I want to kind of start with just what it, uh, we're going to have an anatomy picture. Um, but when we talk about our GI system, we really start from the top up here in the nose and, um, and the back of the throat all the way down to the stomach. It's not just what's going on in your stomach. So we have the back. Of, so we have the nose. Um, so, and then it kind of comes back to the back of the throat, and that's called the nasopharynx back here. Coming down into the throat, which is called, um, down to your larynx, which is the vocal cords. And then it goes down the esophagus, and the esophagus connects into the stomach. And at the level of the, between the esophagus and the stomach, this is where you get the, the hands going here, <laughs> um, there's a sphincter there, there's a muscle there, it's supposed to stay nice and tight. Between, and it's called the GE junction, so it's between the, uh, the stomach and the esophagus to help hold everything down to the stomach. So we have the esophagus coming down, we have the stomach down here, and then going across, we have the diaphragm. And the diaphragm holds hold all the stomach things, or the uh, abdominal things down to the abdomen, and helps hold everything that's supposed to be up in the thoracic cavity, up in the chest, up in the chest. So when you start, as soon as you start putting food in your mouth, everything starts working in the GI tract, trying to break that down. The whole point is to break down that food to get it down to the small intestines to get the nutrients out of the food. But you can't get a big, big chunk of meat from here down here and be able to absorb the nutrients that you need. So as soon as you start putting food in your mouth, your, food, the, your salivary glands start kicking it in and starting to help moisten the food, starting to break it down. And everything kind of gets turned on almost at the same time. So then you come down to your esophagus. Your esophagus, it's almost kind of like, if you think almost like a snake kind of going like this. So you start swallowing and your, your esophagus starts doing this thing. It'll push the food down. People have things like scleroderma. They can't do this part anymore. Their esophagus is nice straight tight. So they have a hard time getting food to come down because they can't do this peristalsis, this moving everything through. Then it goes into the stomach where the stomach starts making all of its acid. The gallbladder's been pumping its stuff into the stomach and into the small intestines to help break things down. So everything's kind of turned on as soon as you put that first bite of something in your mouth. It's not waiting until it hits your stomach before the stomach says it's time to work. The whole process going from your mouth piece of food for your mouth, to going into your small intestine outside of your stomach. It takes about two hours, if not longer. So it takes a long time to do all that. So that's why when we're telling you things like, you know, you gotta wait or eat slower, and you gotta wait for things, that's why it's part of it, because we're waiting for the whole system to go. Um, so between your uh, esophagus, well, when we're looking, we've got the, again, the posterior pharynx, and then we come, as we come down the throat, where we have the esophagus, and then we have the trachea, right? They're right, they're close to each other. And so you have what's called the glottis, which helps, is supposed to block the trachea from any food going down when you, take, when you swallow something. And sometimes people's glottises don't work really well, so food can kind of sneak down into the windpipe, into the trachea, and people start coughing and choking. <clears throat> so when we have acid reflux, what happens is that when the food, actually I'm going to back up for a minute. Um, I want to talk about hiatal hernias for a minute. I know people kind of wondered what that is. So what a hiatal hernia is, again, we have the esophagus and the stomach stem here. The diaphragm is here, holding everything we're supposed to be. 
but there's a hole in the diaphragm because the esophagus has to go down to the stomach. That's the only place you diaphragm that there's a hole. But sometimes the stomach can sneak up into that hole a little bit and it gets caught because the diaphragm, the muscle of the diaphragm is squeezing it. So a little piece of the stomach is then stuck up over the diaphragm and that's the hiatal hernia. So it doesn't have that diaphragm to help pull things in the stomach and everything down here. It actually is squeezing the stomach a little bit so it's kind of squirting everything back up all the time. So when people um, complain about the hiatal hernia and they call it, have an acid reflux from that because it's getting squeezed and all those juices that the stomach keeps making is getting squirted back up. One of the biggest problems that we see is that um, that sphincter, that muscle that's pulled in the esophagus um, and the stomach between those things to hold everything, all the juices down in the stomach. And that muscle gets loose quite a lot. And that's one of the biggest things to, uh, to blame acid reflux on, is that muscle getting looser. And we're going to talk about that kind of as we go, and what, what kinds of things are loosening that muscle. So, when we talk about acid reflux, we kind of talk about two different aspects of it. So the first one's um, GERD, or gastric esophageal reflux. You put the D on for disease, acid or disorder, however you want to call it. So the uh, gastric esophageal reflux disorder, which is different than reflux, because reflux is just you have reflux. Disorder is what's causing the problems. And the second one is laryngeal pharyngeal reflux, or LPR. So laryngeal pharyngeal reflux is when the reflux gets all the way back up here into the vocal cords, on the laryngeal area back here. Um, so those are two different things in some ways. In some ways, it's just kind of a continuation of its own issues kind of going on. So what are symptoms of having acid reflux? Well, everybody knows I've got the heartburn. Yeah, I feel the chest pain. Um, I burp a lot. But then there's more subtle signs. They're saying, well, I just kind of have some pain maybe down here. Some epigastric pain just kind of sitting in here. It hurts after I eat. I just don't feel comfortable. I'm feeling kind of full. And then if I burp, it kind of feels better. Um, I'm coughing. Um, I get a bitter taste in the back of my throat. Um, what's another? I feel like there's a lump in, my, in the back of my throat. Okay, those are all, all symptoms of acid reflux. Some people have acid reflux and they don't have symptoms. Some people have acid reflux so bad they have such chest pain they think they're having a heart attack and they end up in the emergency room. Does anyone ever had that experience? There's someone back there. And they end up giving you things like Mylanta and some Zantac and all those kinds of things and you go, whew, I feel better. We let a nice big burp, and you're like, oh wow, my chest pain went away. I guess it's not my heart today. Um, but some people will go to the emergency room so bad they call 911 to go in and make sure they're not having a heart attack. When it comes up here, it's laryngeal pharyngeal reflux. Some additional symptoms. Again, you may not have any of the stuff here. You may just have symptoms up here. They can include feeling like there's a lump in the back of your throat, <coughs> constantly having to clear your throat. <clears throat> kind of going like this. Um, you get hoarse a lot. You feel like you have a problem with swallowing. Perhaps having a problem when you try to eat something, you just can't get it down because everything's very irritated and swollen in there. Um, some people with acid reflux itself down here, they can have problems swallowing here. They feel like something's getting stuck down here. Um, with GRD, with LPR, you feel like something's getting stuck more up here. Some people might feel like they have a tickle in the back of their throat, feathers tickling them a little bit. This one's kind of hard to tease out sometimes. Is it acid reflux up there on the vocal cords, causing the vocal cords to be very swollen, be very raw, very irritated? Or is it maybe postnasal drip, some things dropping down the back of your throat, constantly irritating things back here? So sometimes we have to kind of tease those out. So the vocal cords, when they go down, the ear, nose, and throat doctors, everyone has a little scope onto their vocal cords, ENT does it. Anyone ever have that? No? Yeah. So they put a little tiny scope, just like um, a smaller version of having like a colonoscopy kind of scope. It's a little teeny, teeny, tiny one they do in the office. And they'll sneak it through your nose, back into the back of your throat, and they can look at your vocal cords. And they can see if they're looking very red, swollen, irritated. Um, and they can say, and we think it looks like some acid reflux. 
The esophagus, the lining here, is, has some protection against acid reflux. So it doesn't get irritated all the time. The vocal cords doesn't have any protection. So they get irritated that much quicker and it's that much harder for them to heal. Um, if acid reflux is not treated, for some people, it can get bad enough that they can get what's called um, Barrett's esophagitis or um, um, Barrett's disease, which is the esophagus gets so red and raw and irritated, um, it can be, become cancerous. So it is always a reason to kind of take it seriously if you're having more than, you know, if you're occasionally burping, that's one thing. If you eat a huge meal for Thanksgiving and you're feeling the acid reflux, that's one thing. When you're complaining of acid reflux multiple times a week, that's something that needs to be taken care of. <clears throat> so, any questions so far? So, how does it affect the lungs? Acid reflux can affect many aspects of the pulmonary tract. It can affect asthma. It can cause a chronic cough. It can worsen COPD. It can, um, it, there's a connection between that and pulmonary fibrosis. There's a connection between sleep apnea and acid reflux. So it can affect it in many different ways. So I think I'll start with the um, obstructive sleep apnea. We'll go with that one first. So anybody in here have sleep apnea? Several people? Everywhere there's CPAP? <laughs> We've got an example. <laughs> um, so when you think about what's happening when you have sleep apnea, you stop breathing through the night multiple times an hour. And what you're doing is you're slowly closing off your trachea, and then you, you're snoring as that trachea is closing off, and then it closes, you're, and you stop breathing, your carbon dioxide levels go high, that triggers your brain to say, I've got to breathe, so you take this deep breath, and then it starts over again. And when you take that deep breath, you go <laughs> kind of thing. And as you're doing that, it's changing all the pressures here in your chest. And as you're changing those pressures, you're pushing everything back up here onto the, up in here, you can go down your lungs, you're pulling everything from your stomach up there. So um, treating sleep apnea helps acid reflux. Always sounds a little weird, but um, it definitely treats it. So what kinds of things, before we go into the pulmonary things, what kinds of things can cause acid reflux? Spicy. Spicy foods? Alcohol. Alcohol. Coffee. Coffee. Chocolate. Have you heard my lecture? You can see me. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate. Okay. What else? Carbonation. Obesity. Carbonation. Obesity. Pregnancy. Remember everybody mm -hmm. being pregnant? Remember mm -hmm. having a heartburn when you're pregnant? Um, so those things are pushing all those things up here. Pregnancy, obesity is pushing that stomach up. So it's causing everything to keep get pushed up there. Um, things like chocolate, um, caffeine, those kind of alcohol, that's relaxing that muscle between the esophagus and the stomach. So that sphincter there is getting relaxed, so it's allowing things to come shooting back up. Um, big meals, such as Thanksgiving dinner, or if you're one of those people like to go to the all-you-can-eat buffets, and they all big meals. Uh, smoking, smoking again relaxes that sphincter down there, so it causes acid reflux. Um, let's see, did we hit them all? I don't have my slides, so I don't remember if we hit them all. Um, other foods, um, spicy foods, we said high-fat foods, things made with tomatoes, tomatoes themselves, and things made, so spaghetti, sauce, um, lasagna, pizza, pizza hits on many levels, not just the tacos, tacos if they're spicy. Um, orange juice, grapefruit juice, well, so peppermint, chocolate, <coughs> raw onions can do it. Um, and think about when you think of high fat things, think about snacks too. So if you eat potato chips, those are all high in fat. 